Hello again, students. How's it going? As always, Instructor Holland here with the VLP Network, coming to you from inside my new little room that I have in my house. I have a desk here. Uh, I actually have proper lighting and stuff like that. And I actually have a spot where I can sit down that's not my couch. We're making gradual improvements as time goes on. I'd also like to welcome you to a new little thing that we're gonna do here on the Victory Loves Preparation Network. And that is what I'm calling Case Study Sundays. Case Study Sundays are gonna be small little videos that I'm going to make that take a specific tragedy or instance dealing with individuals throughout history, things like serial killers, things like murders, unsolved and solved that happened. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those cases, we're gonna dissect them, look at the facts of the cases and the modus operandi of some of these individuals. And then at the end, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over some things that could have been done better to try and avoid these types of situations. So that way you guys can understand how certain predators and how certain things act so that way we can be better prepared in the future. I'm gonna try and release these videos every Sunday or every other Sunday, depending on when I can upload. My schedule varies every now and then. Starting January 3rd, I'm actually beginning an EMT program. I wanna be a certified EMT, so that way when I go to the Law Enforcement Academy, uh, I'm gonna be a better prepared law enforcement officer. Hopefully that will also allow me to make some videos on more medically based type of stuff, so that way you guys can have a little bit more medical knowledge uh, to be a better prepared individual. I didn't release any videos before because even though I am TECC certified, I don't feel like I have the expertise to sort of give that information out and teach it to you guys. And I don't wanna teach anything to you guys that I myself am not 100% sure of. But regardless, keep an eye out for that type of content and I hope you guys enjoy today's little snippet. So case study Sunday one. Today's case study is gonna be on the Hinter Kaifak murders. I'm not quite sure if you guys have ever heard it. It's not a very well-known uh, sort of case, but it is a creepy one and we're gonna go over the details and then talk about some ways that the family could have potentially avoided it. So with that being said, let class begin. So Hinterkaifeck was actually a farm homestead that was located 43 miles north of Munich, Germany. At the time of the murders, there were six individuals actually living there, five were of the family, and one was the maid. The victims that were present were Andreas Gruber, who was the father, 63 years old, Gazilla Gruber, who was 72, their widowed daughter, Victoria Gabriel, who was 35, Victoria's children, Kazilla, who was seven, and Joseph, who was two. The maid, Maria, was 44 years old. The murders occurred March 31st, 1922, and to this day, they remain unsolved. Police have long suspected specific individuals and have a long list of potential killers, but at this point in time, it doesn't really matter because even if they found out who it was, the murders happened so long ago that the individual that perpetrated them is probably long passed away. The case today is known as one of Germany's greatest unsolved murders, as well as one of its creepiest for the reasons that we're gonna get into in a little bit. Before the events would occur on March 31st, the night of the murders, several strange occurrences started to occur on the farm that led the family and the maids to start to feel really strange and really off-putting. Six months prior to the attack, one of the family maids had actually quit claiming that her reason for leaving was that she heard strange noises in the attic and she believed the house to be haunted. Andreas Gruber, the father, ended up finding a strange newspaper from Munich on the property in March 1922. He couldn't remember buying it and he initially believed that the postman had lost the newspaper. This was found not to be the case though because no one in the surrounding vicinity had actually subscribed to the paper that he had received. Just a few days before the murders, Gruber actually told the neighbors he discovered tracks in the snow that led from the forest to a broken door lock on the farm's machine room. Later on during that night, they heard footsteps in the attic, but Gruber found no one when he searched the building. He told multiple people and multiple neighbors about these experiences, but when they offered help, he refused and he also refused to go to the police. According to a school friend of seven-year-old Kazilla, the girl reported that her mother Victoria had fled the farm the night before uh, after some sort of violent quarrel, it's not really clear what happened, but she fled the farm into the woods and then was found hours later in the woods. So as you can tell already, six months before the murders actually occur, strange things are happening. Okay, so now we're getting into March 31st, the night of the actual murders. So on the afternoon of March 31st, Maria, who was the new maid, was escorted by her sister to the farm. It's possible that Maria's sister was the last person to see the family alive at that point. Obviously, we aren't entirely sure what happened because everyone at the farm was murdered, so there is no eyewitness testimony, but based on police investigation and forensic investigation, it is heavily inferred that the killer was located inside the barn. It is believed that one at a time he managed to lure 
one individual member of the family into the barn, kill them, and then continue to do so until four of the six members of the family were killed. There was further evidence to show that he lured them into the barn through the stable. How he did this, obviously, it's not entirely clear, but somehow he managed to lure the members of the family one by one into the barn and kill them also one by one. The murder weapon was eventually found to be a mattock, which is basically just a very large farming tool, and he primarily used to kill them by hitting them in the head with it. The last two members of the family left alive were the youngest son, Joseph, and the maid, Maria. Both of those individuals were at the time sleeping upstairs in the house, so the murderer left the barn, went upstairs, and killed them in their sleep. So at this point, all members of the family, including Maria, have been killed, and four days pass by before the bodies are ever found. On April 1st, coffee sellers Han Shirovsky and Eddard Shirovsky arrived in Hinterkaifa to try and take the family's order for coffee. They knocked on the doors and windows, but nobody ever responded. They noticed that the gate to the machine house was open, but they decided not to investigate further and left. Kazilla Gabriel, which was Victoria's daughter, was absent from school and Sunday school for multiple days, which was thought to be extremely strange. An assembler by the name of Albert Hoffner went to Hinterkaifeck on April 4th to repair the engine and the food chopper. He stated to police that he had found nothing about the family and heard nothing but the sounds of the farm animals and the dog inside the barn. After about an hour, he decided to begin his repairs and was done after about four hours. Around 3.30 p.m., Lorenz Schlittenbauer sent his son Johann and his stepson Joseph, both aged 16 and 9 years old, to Hinterkaifeck to see if they could make contact with the family. When they reported that they did not see anyone, Schlittenbauer headed to the farm the same day with Michael Pohl and Jacob Sigil. Upon entering the barn, they then found the bodies of Andreas Gruber, his wife Kazilla, his daughter Victoria, and his granddaughter Kazilla. Shortly after, they found the chambermaid Maria and the youngest family member, Victoria's son, Joseph murdered in the home. It's at that point in time that they finally decided to call law enforcement. The police arrived and an investigation began. Now what's very, very, very creepy about this case, besides the stuff that we already talked about, the events that occurred before the murders even happened, is that the reason, one of the reasons primarily, that the murders were not discovered until several days later is because no one suspected that anything had happened to the family. And that's because nearby neighbors, when looking at the farmhouse and the house itself and stuff like that, saw smoke rising from the chimney. They, uh, when they went to the farm itself, they saw that the farm animals had been fed. And upon entering the home, they also ended up finding plates of food and stuff like that that had been consumed. According to investigators, what this says is that after the murders had occurred, the murderer actually ended up staying and living at the farm amongst the corpses for several days, eating food, taking care of the farm animals, and just generally staying there for a few days. Originally, police believed that the motive was robbery, but they quickly overruled that because inside the house they found several large amounts of money that had not been taken, as well as jewelry. Ultimately, no murderer was found, even though the police had multiple suspects, and the case was officially declared cold in 1955. There are many, many, many more details about this case. I'm not going to go over them for the sake of trying to keep this video short, guys. If you want to do your own research, by all means, trust me, there are plenty more really disturbing and creepy things about this case that I haven't mentioned yet. So why is this a good case study in my opinion? Well, in my personal opinion, this case and several other cases that we're going to be going over during Case Study Sundays are excellent pointers to home security and why home security is something that needs to be a primary focus for not just families, but any individual in general. These things are so far out of the minds of people in general and civilians and stuff like that that they never think that stuff like this can happen. I mean, there is evidence in this particular murder case where the perpetrator was staying at the house several days, weeks, months before the murders even happened happened. One of the maids had quit because she thought that the house was haunted because she heard footsteps and other noises that weren't coming from the family members. All of these things occurred and yet Andreas, the father of the family, refused to ask for help, call the police, or even do a thorough search of his property. And I think that's the first thing that we can take away from this. Situational awareness is something that most people don't have and I think situational awareness in this case is going to be a big, big thing that can keep people's survivability up. When you have multiple strange experiences is occurring in the house. Things like footsteps. They also found the, uh, the lock to the machinery room was broken. That in and of itself warrants a more detailed search in my opinion, don't you think? His neighbors, when he brought this stuff to their attention, said, hey, would you like help searching your property? And he refused. Whether it was because of pride or something else, he didn't feel like he needed to do that. 
He also refused to report this to the cops and the police so that way the police could come over and also do a thorough investigation of his home. Keeping situational awareness during thorough searches of your home while simultaneously not letting your pride and your ego get the better of you are three very important points in this case. In a way, this case actually kind of reminds me vaguely of certain experiences that I had when I was working down in Los Angeles as an executive protection agent. There were times where I was called to a client's house then they had security issues and stuff like that. I can remember this one particular time where a weird crazy fan had actually hopped my client's um, uh, fence and stuff like that and had knocked on her window and everything when she was in bed. I know, really freaky. But she called me to the property and she said, Holland, can you kind of give me almost like a security kind of checkup a little bit with my property and my house and stuff like that to see kind of where the weak points are. So as I'm doing this check, I go into the back and I see that the fence that actually had been hopped over was kind of broken and was folded over. Now, I am not entirely sure if the perpetrator did that, but I'm willing to bet it was like that before because it looked like it had just suffered from, you know, old age and neglect. Well, when I brought this to her attention, one of the first things she asked me was, well, how much is that going to cost? I gave some sort of generic number and then she ended up saying to me, huh, well, I don't know. That seems a little bit pricey. I couldn't help but inwardly laugh because this is coming from a woman who has things like chandeliers imported from France that are easily $10,000, you know, Venetian, uh, you know, pottery and stuff like that. All these things decorating her home. So she's obviously not, you know, hurting for money at this point in time. But for some reason, and I couldn't really figure out why, she wouldn't fork out the few hundred bucks or even a thousand bucks it would take to put a whole new brand up fence around her property. So when I hear that Andreas didn't want to ask for help, for whatever reason, that kind of hits home with me in this case. Security is never a forefront thing in our mind until it has to be, until tragedy occurs. And at that point, it may be too late. So make sure to focus on security now. Another thing that points out to me in this case is the fact that one by one, the members of the family, except for two, were lured into the barn and killed individually. Now, while I have no idea just exactly how the murderer lured the members of the family into the barn, the fact that they were alone is something that I'd like to point out. Anyone who was watching who was in the military knows about the term battle buddy. If you weren't in the military, I'll explain very quickly. A battle buddy essentially means that regardless of where you go, you always take a friend with you. The reason is because in a hostile environment, you never know what's going to happen. If you go off on your own and let's take an extreme example, a sniper ends up picking you off. Even though that shot may be heard, your platoon and your unit doesn't understand what may have happened to you. If we take any survival situation, if you're not required or forced to be alone, then always take someone with you because your survivability always increases double as long as someone else is alongside you. The first member of the family being lured into the barn and being killed, okay, maybe she didn't understand what was going on, but upon her disappearance, I'm willing to bet that there must have been at least some kind of search. Hey, where is so-and-so? I have no idea. Maybe we should go look for her. Again, I'm not entirely sure how the killer managed to lure them individually into the barn, but if they had gone together, maybe things would have turned out a little bit differently. Oftentimes, predators and individuals who are trying to prey on people really don't like to go after groups specifically for the reason that they might get overpowered or they might not be able to handle them all at once so that way individuals can go and call for help. We are always stronger in groups and for that reason, if you're going to investigate something that doesn't seem quite right, always take a battle buddy with you. It's like those stupid scary movies where the fun, you know, it, it takes place in a house or something like that and it's a husband and wife and the husband hears a noise in the, 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 the living room or something and so he, he tells his wife, stay here. I always look at my girlfriend and I go, if that ever happens, you're fucking coming with me. <laughs> and that's simply because survivability increases when you have somebody else alongside with you. So I think that's another important thing to take away from this case. So ultimately, in conclusion, students, the three primary lessons I think would be a good takeaway from this sort of case study would be, one, having situational awareness so that way you can better understand what's going on around you. Two, ensuring to do a proper check of your home and a thorough check of your home if something seems off while simultaneously getting the help that you need if you think that you're going to need help. And for never going anywhere during a scenario that seems a little bit off alone. These three things I think could have definitely helped out this particular family. God rest their souls. I really hope that at some point maybe the police can come up with something. But at this point in time, it's such an old murder and it's been cold for so long that... I highly doubt that anything's going to be figured out about this case. Let's just hope that another Hinter Kaifax somewhere else in the world doesn't really happen. So that's it, students. I hope you had a good time looking at this case. I hope it didn't creep you out too much. But ultimately, I hope that you take 
cases like this and if you are a fan of uh, sort of like you know real life crime and stuff like that like I am I hope you don't listen to it just for entertainment value I really really sincerely hope that you take specific lessons away from it because if you dissect the nuances of the case and you look at the tiny details you can almost always find out things that could have helped people avoid the situations they in were involved in like I said I'll be coming out with more case studies like this so be sure to stay tuned on my channel if you want to hear more I hope everyone has a safe Christmas coming up, and I hope everyone stays safe and prepared in general life because, again, victory loves preparation. I'll see you guys next time. Class is dismissed.